Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, a special edition where we sit down and go in depth with former ALEA chief Spencer Collier. All this coming up next on The V. The Voice of Alabama Politics with your host, Bill Brett. Now, the number one political show in Alabama, The V. Welcome to The Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt. Today, we have a special edition, In-Depth with Spencer Collier. Spencer, welcome. Thanks for having me, Bill. I've known you long enough that I feel comfortable calling you Spencer, and I, I know you feel comfortable calling me Bill. I, absolutely, by all means. Uh, appreciate your, your, your friendship and what you do. Well, we, uh, we feel uh, that you need to air what you have said previously and things that maybe you've learned since then, if you feel comfortable with that. Sure. But, you know, you and I talked, and I asked, would you give our viewers uh, an overview of what has happened to you and how we got to where we are at this juncture with a lawsuit and Governor Bentley appearing before a grand jury on what appears to be matters that related to your firing and other activities at ALEA. You had a long, close relationship with Robert Bentley going back to the legislature and he w you were his trusted confidant uh, for a long mm -hmm. time. Tell us a little bit about that relationship. Uh, well, I mean, that's a very good description, Bill. We, uh, we were both elected in 02. Um, uh, Republicans gained a handful of seats. We, you know, we didn't take the majority. Um, but, but we were part of, uh, I think, a class of about 19. What was unique is I think I was the youngest member of that Republican class, and uh, Governor Bentley was the oldest member of that Republican class. Uh, but we just we hit we hit it off. We uh, ideology you know on basic ideology we we generally agreed right um, and uh, quickly became uh, very good friends. Um, whether it would be at events, uh, Melissa and I got to know um, Governor and uh, Miss Diane very well, and uh, we just got to, we just got to be friends. But there were there was if it's there was one really particular issue, uh, Bill, that affected my district. I served on the Ag Committee and for years fought efforts to, to ban uh, certain nets. Uh, and that may sound trivial, but it was, two, it was 200 businesses in my district. Right. Um, These are fishing nets. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on the Ag Committee, Robert made, or excuse, excuse me, Governor Bentley made the difference uh, and, and, and keeping, helping me keep that 200 families right. still working. So it kind of it bonded us. Right. And uh, we, we, were just, we were just close. And, and the people, because of all the things you've done and your position, a lot of people don't understand that you're, you're in your uh, early 40s, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yes. And, yes. and Governor Bentley's in his early 70s. Correct. So there, there is a father-son sure. dynamic as far as age goes. Sure, sure yes. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be inconceivable that he actually was your dad. And, sure. and y'all did have certainly yeah. a close relationship yeah, like that. Absolutely. Um, um, you know, just uh, everyone has a difficult story to tell. But sure. I mean, uh, you know, for me, uh, I grew up in, in a working class uh, or probably a working poor family. Right. Uh, in South Monroe we County, did. we just didn't know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't think I don't think we knew it. Uh, we thought we thought that was uh, just the way it was supposed to be done. Uh, but you know, just came from a, from a, that working class uh, family, and um, you know, it taught it taught me the roots and and and, and the values uh, that that I needed. Yeah, I think what could, what connected me with the governor is uh, his father. Uh, he had told me had very, you know, came through very similar situations. Right. Uh, was a pulp, pulp water, so those those different backgrounds uh, just really just really connected us. You know, and 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 y'all did. I mean, I, just at the State of the Union, this past State of the Union, he praised you and your office, and then all of a sudden, that all changed. 
what soured the relationship? Well, th things began to change uh, in the summer of 2014 uh, between the governor and I. Um, I began to hear rumors of an improper relationship. Uh, uh, Bill, you, you know better than anyone in, in politics in Alabama. Uh, you know, a rumor can start one way and be you know, totally different Absolutely. Uh, the next day. I didn't believe it. I just said, you know, no, absolutely no way. I made sure that his detail security guys were not involved in any, any of, the, of the rumor mill. Well, um, first week of August, uh, the, the governor's chief, uh, chief of protective services, Ray Lewis, uh, came to me. And uh, one of the governor's uh, security uh, troopers, uh, who happened to be Stan Stabler, uh, had picked up the governor's phone. They were at a BCA conference in Point Clear. The governor got out. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm getting this second, second hand. The governor got out. And as he got out, uh, the phone was sitting in the console. And if you know those Suburbans, they have very wide consoles right, right, for that right. reason. Uh, the phone went off. It buzzed. Uh, accordingly, Stan picked it up. And the message was romantic in nature. Uh, uh, Stan brought it to the attention of his supervisor, who was the Chief of Protective Services, Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis brought it to my attention. Uh, that then began to concern me. And then literally within, within a day or so of that, uh, just got a knock on the door one day at 3 o'clock, and Ray said, Mr. Secretary, can I see you? Uh, he had his laptop, and uh, he said, I've got an email that you, that you need to hear. Uh, and uh, he had the governor's family on the phone, he had some of the family members on the phone. And uh, he played me several, several snippets of a conversation that I could clearly tell was, was Governor Bentley. Um, Is this the tape that yes. we've heard? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and we've got about a minute here. Uh, you, we'll, when we get back from the break, we'll talk about it. But, what did it take to, what did it do to you to have to confront this man over this? I mean, how were you feeling when you had to do that? Uh, you know, it had to be done. Uh, I, I knew that, and I told, I told Ray that. I said, and Ray and the governor were close. Uh, I said, you know, this is a situation, and we're aware of it. We're, we're all in, and we have to address it. Uh, so um, we, we, we knew without a doubt we, we had to confront him uh, to do that, and we put that plan together. Uh, that, that very afternoon. Uh, do it. Uh, it, it, it had to be somewhat, I mean, it had to be difficult emotionally on some level for you. It, it was um, to, to hear the snippets. Uh, and again, I didn't hear the full audio. Right, uh, right. But in it, it was, I mean, there's, Bill, there's no doubt. It's, it's sexual in nature. And that's what I heard. Uh, it, it, it disappointed me. Right. Uh, it did. Well, let's pick this up when we get back. I appreciate you being so forthcoming with us. Sure. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back with Spencer Collier. Back to the V, the voice of Alabama politics, a special edition, in-depth 
with Spencer Collier. Spencer, we were talking about how this was a difficult choice for you to make, but one nevertheless that had to be made. Tell us about the conversation that you and Ray Lewis had with the governor. Right. Well, well Ray and I made the decision that uh, we checked his schedule. He was traveling that day. Um, all this can be easily verified, Bill. Um, he was traveling that day to uh, uh, Greenville. It was a fundraiser for Representative Chris Sales. Uh, I, so the plan was to dismiss his security, and Ray and I would handle his security. And uh, during that 40-minute drive, would give us an opportunity to speak with the governor and confront him about it. Uh, but Bill, when he came out of the rear of the Capitol and saw Ray and I standing by the suburban, uh, the look on his face, he knew instantly something was wrong. That yeah. would be very unusual for me to, to be there. So. Um, I told him that uh, I dismissed his security and I needed to cover something with him. And he said, okay. Uh, we got in the car. Uh, Ray was driving. The governor was in the front. I was in the back. And uh, this is exactly what I told him. I said, Go governor, I, I, I love you. And there's nothing I wouldn't do for you except lie to a grand jury. I said, now in saying that, uh, I just heard snippets of an audio tape that without a doubt is your voice, and it was sexual in nature. Uh, and I said, there's, there's just, don't waste my time or yours. We know each other well enough. It is what it is. And Bill, uh, he, he hung his head. He, he never denied it. And you know what strikes me as odd is he never asked about the specific details uh -huh. of the event, which would lead me to believe may have been multiple times. Right, right. So he, you know, if it was a one-time thing, you would know the details. Sure. He never asked the, 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 the details of it. Uh, he just asked me, he said, are you, are you sure that you can tell us? And I said, absolutely. Um, but what I also pointed out, and, and I said, Governor, I've got two roles here. One is uh, I am the Secretary of Law Enforcement that you appointed me to, uh, and I have that role. And the second role is, is your friend and you're confident, confidant, and I, I said, then I, I want to tell you, no one's perfect. Uh, we've all made mistakes, and so this is not about making mistakes. It's about uh, we've, we've got a problem, and we have to fix it. So I was clear and said, Governor, if you have used st state resources to facilitate this relationship or in any way enrich um, uh, Ms. M Ms. Mason, uh, that is a crime. I said, and additionally, if you have used campaign money to circumvent using taxpayer dollars to facilitate this relationship, well, that, that also could, could be a crime. I said, now in saying that, if that has not occurred, this is an easy fix. Just have to stop. Right. Have to stop. And uh, Ray was involved in the conversation. Neither one of us was judgmental. Neither, neither one of us was. We by no means tried to shame him. We, we had failed and made mistakes in our life. And uh, at that point, he said, he, you know, he had not used state resources, had not used campaign resources, and uh, that it just had to be fixed. And he, he, he literally asked me, how do I do it? And this is what I told him. I said, Governor, it's, it may be bloody, but you, you, you got to just chop it off. You got to chop the arm off. It, it has to stop. And uh, he said, no. Okay. Now, and, and think about it. This is over a 40 minute period. Right, so right. It's, it's back and forth. A lot of back and forth. Yeah. But we made it to Greenville and we were still in the conversation. So we stayed parked in the, uh, in, 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 in the suburban. And I remember some of his staff was there waiting, uh, who can easily verify uh, um, that we, we were in there. Uh, he, at that point, uh, told Ray and I that he, he, he would stop, that he understood it. In fact, he thanked us for um, caring enough about him to confront him about it, but, but confront him in a, in a caring way. Right, and which obviously sounds like you did, uh, but he just could not keep his promise. I know he told you later, and then things, it, you know, seem to, from our reporting, what our understanding has been over the past several months is that it got worse and more distant 
He did not break off the relationship with Rebecca Caldwell Mason, at that time his uh, senior advisor, right. uh, who was being paid, I guess, by this Ace Gov Foundation or out of his campaign. Uh, so at that point, she's being paid by the campaign or Ace Gov, and y'all have confronted him. And then comes up a matter where you're asked to give an affidavit to Matt Hart concerning events that surrounded the Mike Hubbard case. Tell us how that came. We don't have to go into the details sure. of how that came sure. about. But what happened uh, that you were going to give the affidavit, you seem to have the okay. Uh, and let's just start off with you were, Matt called you, I guess, Matt Hart, sure, and yeah. said, uh, you know, can you give me an affidavit? Well, I mean, uh, so we're talking from uh, when we confronted them about the relationship August of 14 to, to uh, January, February of, of this year. Uh, our office received a, a complaint from, uh, uh, from a gentleman that used to be on, on this yeah. show and made some allegations. Um, would only speak to me. Uh, I, I, I met with him. Uh, heard his allegations, explained to him, I'm not an invest investigator, but I, I could assign an investigator. Um, uh, I, I assigned a very competent investigator who, who specializes in public corruption um, in those type cases. Uh, he worked the case. I, I, I advised the governor that we had had the complaint and that I had assigned a special agent to work it, uh, but pretty quickly, uh, probably in, within less than a week, the agent was able to, uh, to come back and, in his opinion, that uh, uh, no laws were broken, nothing was done uh, improper, uh, and we, we, we felt that uh, the investigation was closed at that point. Th that would have been what we call a probable cause investigation. Right. There was no probable cause established. Right. So that investigation was done. So. When we were done, we, we got a call from the attorney general's office, and um, it was actually it was Matt, and he wanted to bring some some things to our attention. Uh, he was a, he was aware that we had we had done an investigation. Um, he explained to me that that had been part of a defense strategy. Right. At one point, there was a complaint to the FBI, uh, and he he presented me with some information. Uh, the gentleman that, that made the initial complaint, um, um, Mr. Hart provided me with the information to show he, he, he had been a confidential informant for the Attorney General's office uh, since 2012. I saw the documentation. Uh, now, th why that's important is if, if um, we would have known that when he came in, that he was a CI for another law enforcement agency. Um, we would immediately contact that agency. Um, but in saying that, uh, they in no way, the Attorney General's Office in no way tried to get involved in our investigation. I didn't get involved. I, a very competent special agent. And uh, we, we explained to the Attorney General's Office that we got the complaint. Uh, there was no probable cause. Uh, so what Matt asked for was uh, either testimony or an affidavit. And I want to leave it right okay. there for now. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Thank you, Spencer. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics, special edition with Spencer Collier. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Nobody. I... <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Spencer, you were talking about how you had, uh, you know, wrapped up the investigation. Uh, Matt Hart, which is the chief of the uh, White Collar Crimes Public Corruption Division of the Alabama uh, Attorney General's Office. And at some point, uh, he did ask you to provide either testimony or an affidavit. This turned into what I perceived 
as the events that led up to your firing. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about the meeting that you had where this was brought up and the reactions of Governor and Ms. Mason. Sure. Well, it, um, it, Initially, the governor's reaction was like any other law enforcement action. Um, I, I informed him that we had completed it and there was uh, nothing to it. Uh, and I told him that we, we would probably provide an affidavit, one, and one from me and one uh, because uh, the gentleman spoke to me and one from the special agent. Um, so, and that was done in a meeting. We, in, we informed the governor uh, where, where we were. And in the meeting was the governor, governor's legal advisor, uh, myself and the special agent, I don't want to name him, but the special agent that, that worked the case, uh, and we explained to the governor, uh, we're, we're, we're done, they, they want an affidavit, uh, they're a law enforcement agency, we have an obligation to cooperate. Uh, you know, maybe not in that tone, but it was, it was described right. that we were going to move forward. Well, in that meeting, the governor's uh, tone went from, well, I, you know, I don't know if I would sign one. And then as it, the meeting went on, it, it went to, uh, I, I don't want you guys to do that. And then before we left, it went to, well, listen, just tell Matt you're still investigating. Well, it, that's a crime in the state of Alabama to lie to an agent of the attorney general's office. So it's left the governor's office. I knew that option just was not going to happen. Uh, so it was, a, it was a long night. I had to make a tough decision. Uh, but the next morning when I got to the office, my executive counsel was, had been on the phone with David Byrne, the governor's executive counsel, and um, had drawn up the affidavits. Let me ask you a quick question. I want to interrupt you. I want you to tell the story, but I'm very interested in, you know, it, it seems like Bentley started backing up. Did, do you have, did you at the time, or do you now, have any idea why he did not want you to speak, uh, provide the affidavit. I, I, I do. At the time, I didn't. But I am. Uh, my opinion is, is that uh, he in no way wanted uh, to have to testify in that case. And, and he, he had been before the grand jury. Uh, the governor had been clear, very clearly neutral on the Mike Hubbard issue. But that seemed to change. And that, is the mo that was the most involved he had ever gotten in a criminal case. And to, to make it worse, Ms. Mason knew the details. Remember, this is, this is a sensitive criminal investigation. Right. And she knew the details. Uh, so that led up to a second meeting. Okay. Uh, I, I received a call that the governor wanted to see me. Uh, and basically, it was anyone that was involved in this affidavit process. Right. Uh, so that included myself, my, my executive counsel, the special agent that worked the case. Uh, I brought along um, uh, the day-to-day -day administrator for the agency, J.T. Jenkins, right. and then brought along my chief of staff, uh, Hal Taylor. Actually, the governor asked for Hal Taylor to be there. Right. Uh, so we walk into the meeting, and now looking back, uh, there, there are some things that I, I should have taken note of and maybe stopped. Uh, there were some things in there that, that just didn't seem right. Now, Joe Espy was there, who was right. the governor's personal attorney with matters that we are not sure of or unclear. Right. And Ms. Mason was there. Right. Uh, if you could quickly break down, I heard it, you know, we've heard that it was very uh, volatile uh, yes. meeting. Yeah, well, and, and you're right. So, just, so Joe uh, Espy uh, is sitting right next to the governor. Normally, in a briefing like that, uh, the guy doing the briefing would do that. But I sat next to Joe, uh, very cordial. Uh, but when I walked in, I could tell Miss Mason's body language was. Uh, I taught kinesics for the, for the, uh, for the troopers, right, right. and so I, I know body language. Well, that that body language was. If that was on the side of the road, I probably got a fight on my hands. Right. You could just tell arms crossed. Right. Uh, and as the meeting went on, uh, the governor began to berate my staff members so, uh, and myself. So I, I stopped him and said, Governor, I'm the secretary. This is on me. Uh, I made the decision uh, to, to sign it. I thought it was the legal, the moral, and the right thing to do. And it's unfair to take it out on on my staff. Did, did Ms. Mason at any time raise her voice? Abs or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she, she yelled, uh, don't you understand uh, 
that you have now inserted him in this case. Uh, I mean, you know, basically implied, uh, you know, that I, that I was stupid. Well, you know, we have heard, and uh, I, I, I think I've heard this from two people with inside Bentley's inner, inner circle, that Rebecca Mason has convinced Governor Bentley that Matt Hart is evil and that it's Matt Hart they had to worry about uh, and that uh, they do have some exposure, it, it appears to me, but that's my opinion. We've only got about two minutes, so we're going to have to wrap it up. As a result, you were put on medical leave. They put that story out there that Chuck Dean said that you were being punished. And the next thing you know, you, you were punished. You were fired uh, without cause, you said. You, you lost your health insurance. How has that affected your life? How has that right. affected your family? Well, that, uh, there, there, there was clearly a movement that to, that's a life destroyer. Uh, it's one thing to fire someone. It's something else to accuse them of criminal activity. And they did that in the press. In, in the press. Uh, Chuck Dean had the information before I, I was ever, I, and I've never been questioned. Um, uh, the governor has repeated on at least three accounts that I, that I committed a crime. Um, and, and that has just... What it has done to my family, and not only have I lost my job, the governor's put out there that I've committed uh, a crime. Right. Uh, you know, examiners of public accounts have given us a clean bill of health during my tenure. I welcome any examination by the attorney general, the FBI office, not by Leah anymore. Uh, I'm, no. uh, I, I don't. Uh, we ran. There, there, there was no mismanagement of money. We we ran a very uh, good and healthy and legal operation. You've got a lawsuit. When is the date supposed to be before the court? Uh, Bill, I should know, and I don't. It's, it's in August. I think it's August 18th. Okay. The governor's consolidated all the, excuse, I'm sorry, the judge has consolidated all the motions into one hearing uh, that we'll have that day. I believe it's Judge Jean Reese. Right. We, uh, we feel very, very good about it. I, I do. I know we're close on time. Right, I want right. to point out, I hope that people notice that the governor initially stated I fired him for calls, and we're going to fight this. Right. Uh, well, now it's uh, I have sovereign immunity, and I can do anything I want. Well, and he does seem to think that he is the king of Alabama and not just the governor. I want to thank you for your service to the state. I think what's happened to you is going to be proven that there was wrongdoing in the courts. We've investigated it up and down, and it looks bad for Governor Bentley. Uh, I know your wife. Please give her our best. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate you guys very much. You've been watching a special edition of The V with Spencer Collier. You watch us because we watch them.